everybody. It is your favorite school librarian, Ms. Dev. And today I am here with Martin, Jason, and Alfredo. Say hi to everybody, you guys. Hi. Okay, they didn't want to be on camera, but they're going to help me out today with my read aloud. And you guys are in what grade? Seventh, seventh grade. How are you liking seventh grade so far? You're liking it? You think it's good? Okay, well, that's what they're telling me anyway. So today we are going to read Pan's Labyrinth by Guillermo del Toro and Cornelia Funk, okay? So Pan's Labyrinth, the Labyrinth of the Fawn, we have it in English. Y también tenemos en español El Labyrinto del Fauno by Guillermo del Toro y Cornelia Funk. All right, so we're going to read chapter one today of Pan's Labyrinth. This book is, so this is the summary. This book is not for the faint of the heart or weak in spirit. It's not for skeptics who don't believe in fairy tales or the powerful forces of good. It's only for brave and intrepid souls like you who will stare down evil in all its forms. Inspired by the critically acclaimed film written and directed by Oscar winner Guillermo del Toro, and reimagined by New York Times bestselling author Cornelia Funk, this haunting tale takes readers to a darkly magical and war-torn world filled with richly drawn characters, including trickster fawns, murderous men, child-eating monsters, courageous rebels, and a long-lost princess hoping to be reunited with her family. Perfect for fans of the movie and readers who are new to Guillermo del Toro's visionary work alike, this atmospheric and absorbing novel is a portal to another universe where there is no wall between the real and the imagined, a daring and unforgettable collaboration between two brilliant storytellers. All right, let's get into uh, Pan's Labyrinth. So notice the beautiful art that this book has right here. All right, we're gonna start with the prologue. It is said that a long, long time ago, there lived a princess in an underground realm where neither lies nor pain exist, who dreamt of the human world. Princess Moana dreamt of a perfect blue sky and an infinite sea of clouds. She dreamt of the sun and the grass and the taste of rain. So one day the princess escaped her guards and came into our world. Soon the sun erased all her memories and she forgot who she was or where she came from. She wandered the earth, suffering, cold, sickness, and pain, and finally she died. Her father, the king, would not give up searching for her, for he knew that Moana's spirit was immortal and he hoped that one day it would come back to him, in another body, at another time, perhaps in another place. He would wait down to his last breath until the end of time. What are we thinking, guys? Do we like it so far? Yep. Yep. Yeah, it kind of has that otherworldly vibe, huh? Yeah. Ooh. Okay, let's get into chapter one, which is called The Forest and the Fairy. There was once a forest in the north of Spain, so old it could tell stories long past and forgotten by men. The trees anchored so deeply in the moss-covered soil they laced the bones of the dead with their roots while their branches reached for the stars. So many things lost. The leaves were murmuring as three black cars came driving down the unpaved road that cut through ferns and moss. But all things can be lost and found again, the trees whispered. It was the year 1944, and the girl sitting in one of the cars next to her pregnant mother didn't understand what the trees whispered. Her name was Ophelia, and she knew everything about the pain of loss, although she was only 13 years old. Her father had just died a year ago, and Ophelia missed him so terribly that at times her heart felt like an empty box with nothing but her echo of pain in it. She often wondered whether her mother felt the same, but she couldn't find an answer in her pale face. As white as snow, as red as blood, as black as coal, Ophelia's father used to say when he looked at her mother, his voice soft with tenderness. You look so much like her, Ophelia. Lost. They had been driving for hours, further and further away from everything that Ophelia knew, deeper and deeper into this never-ending forest, 
to meet the man her mother had chosen to be Ophelia's new father. Ophelia called him the wolf, and she didn't want to think about him. But even the trees seemed to whisper his name. The only piece of home Ophelia had been able to take with her were some of her books. She closed her fingers firmly around the one on her lap, caressing the cover. When she opened the book, the white pages were so bright against the shadows that filled the forest, and the words they offered granted shelter and comfort. The letters were like footprints in the snow, a wide white landscape untouched by pain, unharmed by memories too dark to keep, too sweet to let go of. Why did you bring all these books, Ophelia? We'll be in the country. The car ride had paled her mother's face even more. The car ride and the baby she was carrying. She grabbed the book out of Ophelia's hands and all the comforting words fell silent. You are too old for fairy tales, Ophelia. You need to start looking at the world. Her mother's voice was like a broken bell. Ophelia couldn't remember her ever sounding like this when her father was still alive. Oh, we'll be late. Her mother sighed, pressing her handkerchief to her lips. He will not like that. He. She moaned, and Ophelia leaned forward to grab the driver's shoulder. Stop, she called. Stop the car. Don't you see that my mother is sick? The driver throttled the engine with a grunt. Wolves. That's what they were, these soldiers accompanying them. Man-eating wolves. Her mother said fairy tales didn't have anything to do with the world, but Ophelia knew better. They had taught her everything about it. She climbed out of the car while her mother stumbled to the side of the road and vomited into the ferns. They grew as densely between the trees as an ocean of feathery fronds from which gray barked trunks emerged like creatures reaching up from a sunken world below. The other two cars had stopped as well and the forest was swarming with gray uniforms. The tree didn't like them. Ophelia could sense it. Serrano, the com commanding officer, came to check on her mother. He was a tall, bulky man who spoke too loudly and wore his uniform like a theater costume. Her mother asked him for water in her broken bell voice, and Ophelia walked a little way down the unpaved road. Water, the trees whispered. Earth, sun. The fern fronds brushed Ophelia's dress like green fingers, and she lowered her gaze when she stepped on a stone. It was gray like the soldiers' uniforms, placed in the middle of the road as if someone had lost it there. Her mother was once again vomiting behind her. Why does it make women so sick to bring children into the world? Ophelia bent down and closed her fingers around the stone. Time had covered it in moss, but when Ophelia brushed it off, she saw it was flat and smooth, and that someone had carved an eye on it, a human eye. Ophelia looked around. All she could see were three withered stone columns, almost invisible among the high ferns. The gray rock from which they were carved was covered in some strange concentric patterns, and the central column had an ancient corroded stone face gazing out into the forest. Ophelia could not resist. She stepped off the road and walked towards it, although her shoes were wet with dew after just a few steps and thistles clung to her dress. The face was missing an eye, just like a puzzle missing a piece waiting to be solved. Ophelia gripped the eye stone and stepped closer. Underneath the nose, chiseled with straight lines into the gray surface, a gaping mouth showed withered teeth. Ophelia stumbled back, when between them, a winged body as thin as a twig stirred, pointing its long, quivering tentacles at her. Insect legs emerged from the mouth and the creature, bigger than Ophelia's hand, hastily scuttled up the column. Ophelia, I'm sorry, once it reached the top, it raised its spindly front legs and started gesturing at her. It made Ophelia smile. It seemed like such a long time after she last smiled. Her lips weren't even used to it anymore. Who are you? She whispered. The creature waved its front legs once more and uttered a, mu a few melodic click clicking sounds. Maybe it was a cricket. Is this what crickets look like? Maybe it was a dragonfly? Ophelia wasn't sure. She'd been raised in a city between walls built from stones that had neither eyes or faces, nor gaping mouths. Ophelia! The creature spread its wings. Ophelia followed it with her eyes as it flew away. 
Her mother was standing just a few steps down the road, Officer Serrano by her side. Look at your shoes, her mother chided with that soft resignation her voice held so often now. Ophelia looked down. Her damp shoes were covered in mud, but she still felt the smile on her lips. I think I saw a fairy, she said. Yes, that's what the creature was. Ophelia was not sure. But her mother would not listen. Her name was Carmen. She was 32 years old and already a widow, and she didn't remember how it felt to look at anything without despising it, without being afraid of it. All she saw was a world that took what she loved and ground it to dust between its teeth. So as much as Carmen loved her daughter, and she loved her very much, she had married again. The world was ruled by men. Her child didn't understand that yet, and only a man would be able to keep them safe. Ophelia's mother didn't know it, but she also believed in a fairy tale. Carmen believed in the most dangerous tale of all, the one about the prince who would save her. Ooh. The winged creature that had been waiting for Ophelia in the column's gaping mouth knew all of this. She knew many things, but she was not a fairy, not in the sense that we like to think about them. Only her master knew her true name, for in the magic kingdom to know a name was to own the being that carried with it, carried it. From the branch of a fir tree, she watched Ophelia and her mother get back in the car to continue their journey. She had waited for this girl for a long time, this girl who had lost so much and would have to lose so much more to find out what was rightfully hers. It wouldn't be easy to help her, but that was the task that her master had given her. And he didn't take it lightly when her orders weren't followed. Oh no, he didn't. Deeper and deeper into the forest, the cars drove, and the girl and her mother and the unborn child. And the creature that Ophelia had named a fairy spread her insect wings folded her six spindly legs and followed the caravan down the road. All right, folks. So um, if you guys uh, like the Aru Shah series, the author of Aru Shah, who is Roshani Chokshi, said about this book, Pan's Labyrinth, The Labyrinth of the Fawn, perfectly unsettling and deeply felt. This reminded me of the best kind of fairy tales, where each chapter is a jewel that when you hold it up to the light, reframes how we see the world around us. So guys, what do we think about this book? Does it sound intriguing to you? Yeah. Yeah? How come, Alfredo? Because it's like about fairy tales and, and like it affects us around society and like how we feel. Okay, very good. I like that. So it's about fairy tales and how um, maybe uh, their effect on society. And it actually does talk about some interesting societal problems, especially the part where she talked about how uh, Ophelia's mom believed in the most dangerous fairy tale of all, the prince coming to save her. Were you guys like, ooh, what's that about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? Okay. So come get um, Pan's Labyrinth today. Once again, we have it in English and we also have it in Spanish. Thank you so much. And I will see everybody in the library soon.